we take a look at the random wire antenna and the 9 to 1 Anon made by LDG. Well hello and welcome once again to the Waters and Stanton video channel. My name's Peter Waters and my ham radio call sign is Golf 3 Oscar Juliet Victor. The random wire antenna, a curious name. Is it really random? And how random is it? And what is the length of a random wire antenna? And where does this 9 to 1 Anun come into the picture? It's popularly advertised in the press and there are many examples on the uh, internet. Well we've recently taken into stock the LDG 9 to 1 Anan and I have to confess I'd never really used one before so I thought I'd explore this so-called random wire antenna and the 9 to, 9, 9 to 1 Anan and see how the two operate. But first of all, let's just take a quick look at the LDG 9 to 1 Anun. Oh, well, by the way, what is an Anun? Well, an Anun is derived from the Balan. Balan means a balanced transformer to unbalanced, balanced to unbalanced Balan. But the Anun is unbalanced to unbalanced. Now, we know that our ham radio transceivers are designed to receive and work with 50 ohm coax cable. Coax cable is unbalanced. And the most unbalanced form of antenna is an end-fed wire. And that's where the random wire comes into the picture. It's a wire that you attach to the transceiver via a piece of coax cable and via an unhun, the unbalanced antenna to the unbalanced coax. So let's take a look at this LDG Anun. The Anun itself is quite small as you can see. You've got the SO239 there which is the feed to the transceiver or receiver and then around here you've got two terminals. One is red and one is black. The red is the uh, live side, in other words the uh, wire and the black one is the earth. The balun is rated at uh, 200 watts and because it's a 9 to 1 balun it expects 50 ohms there and it expects to see 450 ohms there and I'll come to that in a minute. So the 9 to 1 is um, 50, it transfers 450 ohms there down to 50 ohms. So if you put a 450 ohm resistor across those two terminals, you'd expect to get a perfect match. So what exactly is a random wire? Well, back in the old days, we used to have what was called end-fed wires, random wires. They were basically a wire down the garden and you ran it back to your transmitter because basically we didn't have transceivers then. You ran, it, you ran it back to your transmitter. Now, transmitters were valve based and they had pi, pi networks. Now, pi network is capable of handling uh, quite a wide range of impedances. So it wasn't unheard of to connect your wire straight into the pi network output of your transmitter. And very often it worked. But very often it didn't work. And the reason was the Pi network just hadn't got the capability of matching the high impedance that may have been presented by some of these wires. So the way around that was to build yourself an antenna tuner, or as some would say, an antenna matching unit. This was a basic L network which comprised a capacitor and an inductor, both of which were variable. The inductor used to have tappings on it, generally speaking. But you had this antenna tuner and you were then able to match the impedance of that wire no matter what it was, no matter how long or how short it was, and then feed the output into your transmitter. You got a good match 
and it was a very popular antenna. Well, fast forward now to today, we have something called ferrite. Now, ferrite materials enabled us to make transformers, RF transformers in particular. And these transformers have a wide frequency range. So it does mean to say that we can replace our antenna tuner with a ferrite transformer that has a wide frequency range and therefore doesn't need tuning. The downside, of course, is that it's not variable. That transformer is built to match a certain impedance. And in the case of the LDG um, 9 to 1 Anun, it expects to transform whatever is fed to it by a factor of 9, or divisible by 9. So if it sees a 450 ohm load, it's very happy because it can transform that down to 50 ohms, that's the 9 to 1, and it feeds happily into your transceiver. So in basic terms, a 9 to 1 Anun transformer in amateur radio terms and for HF is a way of transforming 450, ohm, 450 ohms down to 50 ohms. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. My antenna probably doesn't present 450 ohms. It could be anything. You're right. And this is where we have to be a bit careful when we talk about random antenna lengths. But first of all, let's go back to basic antenna theory. We know that a quarter wavelength of wire is around about 50 ohms. It's, it's a low impedance. And you can argue the precise impedance de depending on the circumstances. But let's assume that the N-fed wire, N-fed quarter wave is a 50 ohm impedance. In theory, you could plug that straight into your transceiver and just rely on the earth that you have as the return. And I guess in a lot of cases it would work. Certainly not advisable, but it would work. If we increase that antenna length to a half wave, we have a high impedance. Very difficult to match unless you have a proper RF transformer. And in these circumstances, we tend to use the 49 to 1 transformer. And it's a very popular way of feeding an antenna. Because if you have a half wave antenna with a high impedance and you put a 49 to 1 transformer in series with it, it will match the half wave down to the 50 ohm impedance of the transceiver. And not only that, it will also work on harmonics because harmonics of a half wave also have a high impedance, exactly the same impedance as the basic half wave. So we see that a quarter wave antenna without any matching unit will only work happily on one frequency. On all other frequencies, it needs to have some sort of antenna matching unit. We know that a N-fed half wave is very happy on both its fundamental and its harmonics, provided it's, it's, it's fed via a transformer and a wideband transformer. So one transformer will enable that half wavelength of wire to work on its fundamental and its harmonics. Now this is where the random length of wire comes into question. If we adjust the length of our wire to something a little beyond a quarter wave, we raise the impedance to around about 450 ohms. And at that length, we can then use our 9 to 1 anun to match that into our 50 ohm transceiver. So the anun is looking for a 450 ohm load. And if we run out a length of wire and sweep our frequency source across the spectrum, every time it sees a 450 ohm load, it shows low SWR. So in essence, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a length of wire that as near as possible will reflect a 450 ohm load on the various ham radio bands. Actually, it's more difficult than you might imagine. I think there's a belief that the 9 to 1 Anun is perfect for any length of wire. Well, in fact, it's not. It's not perfect at all. 
And in fact, the nine to one Anan is to some extent a bit of a makeshift arrangement. It works. And if you get the antenna length right, it works quite well. And it is a very economical way of producing a multiband antenna with a minimum amount of fuss and work. And dare I say, outlay. Now there is a paper on the, on the internet, which I'll put up here on the screen, but also I shall put a link to it. And that gives the best lengths of wire for a nine to one or random length antenna. Now, if we can make that length of wire such that it's, it is not an exact number of half waves or quarter waves, we will then get near to the point where on each ham radio band, it is a sort of medium impedance. Be nice to get to 450 ohms on every ham radio band, but I'm not sure that's possible. The basic problem, of course, is that the antenna resonant length is very much determined not only on its physical length, but the way it's uh, installed in, in, in situ. There may be things around and whether you've got a straightforward length of wire or you've got an inverted L or whatever, um, they all have an effect on the actual resonant length or non-resonant length of the antenna. So let's take this one stage further. You're not going to get a 450 ohm load on every band. It's not possible because the relationship between the harmonics I found uh, means to say that they do drift a bit. So in other words, on 40 meters, the harmonic on 20 meters is not quite the same as a times two and it progresses up the scale. So we're going to have an impedance which moves up and down. Even if we try and get the perfect length, it just doesn't work on band by band. So it does mean to say you're going to get VSWR and you're going to get VSWR two, three, four to one, maybe even five to one. So how does that work? Well, it works on the principle that if you have a shortish length of coax cable, even a four or five to one SWR doesn't really matter too much. The loss is very, very small indeed, far less than one dB. So provided that you can match that SWR, then there's no problem. And the good thing about that is that most modern transceivers have a built-in antenna tuner. So what in effect the nine to one Anand does is it produces a much lower impedance than you'd otherwise get. That then enables your built-in antenna tuner to match it. Whereas without that, nine to one anon, it probably wouldn't match it, certainly on a number of bands. George three, Oscar, Juliet, Victor, Golf three, Oscar, Japan, Victoria. Yeah, very good afternoon to you. Uh, Golf three, Oscar, Juliet, Victor. Uh, my name's Peter, Papa Echo Tango, Echo Romeo. And you're about 5.7 with QSB. 5.7 with QSB. QSL? Yes, well, traffic for 5.7. You're picking 59. 5.8.9. You're on the Sultanato in Lowerland. Lowerland area. And the Sultanato is the Jamaica. Slip. November Whiskey. 1.8.5. Yeah, QSL and you're 5.9 there. You came up. So the antenna works. And the transceiver I've been using has been the ICOM IC7300, which I still think is a great value rig, great performer, and I'm very happy to uh, use it. So let's uh, have a look now at the installation and see what, uh, what results we got. I've set this up uh, in the situation which perhaps a newcomer might uh, set his system up. I've got the wire just coming through the window and I've got the unun hung on the end of the wire, fed with a short length of coax, about um, three meters long. And I've also attached a uh, counterpoise wire, which uh, you can see also. So you've got three connections. You've got the end fed wire, you've got the counterpoise, and you've got the uh, coax cable. The other essential that you do need is some form of line isolator 
I've got a ferrite core here, 43 type material, which I've wound a few turns around. And that uh, ferrite uh, line isolator must be just um, before the point at which the coax goes into the transceiver. Actually, LDG also do their own line isolator, which, you'll, which you can see on our uh, website. Uh, the purpose of the line isolator is to keep the RF on the outer sheath from going back to the chassis of the transceiver because it can cause all sorts of problems and to give misleading VSWR readings and uh, fool the uh, antenna tuner into thinking um, that something is uh, uh, happening which is not happening. Uh, the antenna that I used was 53 foot of wire, flex, plastic covered flex, it's not, really, not important what the wire is really, uh, 53 foot of uh, plastic flex which was sort of horizontal although it was sloping down the garden a bit but you could uh, configure it as an inverted V or as a, an, an inverted L but the only thing I would say is when you change the uh, shape of the wire it will have some effect on the, um, the actual tuning but really and truly um, the fine tuning of the antenna if that's the right word um, really does need some form of antenna analyzer but if you haven't got an antenna analyzer it doesn't really matter because it's nice to see a low SWR without an ATU but it doesn't really matter because the length of coax feeder that I was using was so short that any VSWR on the coax is of no consequence and if you go for a low VSWR on a particular band almost certainly you'll find that the next band up will not have a good VSWR. Now I have seen on the internet uh, one or two demonstrations of people using 9 to 1 anons and having very very low VSWRs on all bands without an antenna tuner. I can't make that happen and I do question whether that is a good or bad sign because you know if the transformer is working and has got a low loss then you would expect to see the actual VSWR going up and down on a, on a plot as you, tr you track the frequency response across a whole range of frequencies and if you have a completely flat response that is very low I would question that because it does suggest that there may be some losses there. It's nice to see a low VSWR across the, across the spectrum, but it does ring alarm bells. I, in all my tests, could only find spots where the VSWR was good. And the VSWR was good when it met a 450 ohm point in the spectrum. And as I said just now, um, I think that I would expect to see that happening. I wouldn't expect to see a flat line response. So with that in mind, let me just show you the sort of response I was getting on my antenna analyzer. Now you see here quite clearly that there are some very distinctive dips and uh, peaks. The dips, of course, are low VSWR. And it would be nice if those dips would coincide with each band. But they don't they drift about a bit so you can adjust the position of those dips those low vswr points by a change in the length of the antenna by a small amount either way but you'll never get those dips or at least i couldn't get those dips to coincide with all the bands if you're looking for a low vswr all the way along you're going to get into a state of depression because it i don't think it's going to happen but it doesn't actually matter. You know, there are times in radio when there's a psychological point which says, I've got a high SWR and that's not right. Well, sometimes you can have a high SWR. When I say high, I mean three, four, five to one. You can have a high VSWR if you understand why you've got it. And then you appreciate that on a short length of cable, it makes no difference whatsoever. Then just live with it because that high VSWR or modest VSWR is something that the internal ATU of your transceiver takes care of. It's one of the reasons it's there. And as I said several times already, it doesn't make a heap of difference in these situations. What about counterpoises and earths? Well, 
First of all, I did try it with a long length of coax cable and the outer sheathing of the cable does act as a sort of a counterpoise. By the way, if you're new to uh, ham radio or to antennas, counterpoise basically is a length of wire which sort of replaces the earth. Um, if you're operating upstairs, then obviously you can't make a, a decent earth, uh, not an RF earth anyway. And so one way of doing that is to add a counterpoise. I mean, it really only applies to end-fed antennas. And the counterpoise is basically a length of wire that goes from the uh, um, either the chassis of the transceiver or preferably the chassis of the antenna matching unit. Um, and it just goes underneath the antenna. You can drag it on the ground, what have you. Um, length, well, I suppose as much as you can get out really, but it's basically a length of wire that just sits on the ground. There are elevated counterpoises, but we won't go down that route. Um, in this particular case, if I used a long length of coax cable, when I say long, about uh, 40 feet, it acted quite well as a uh, counterpoise. But you must, must, must put a line isolator very near the transceiver end. In this particular case, um, what I did, I had um, around about three meters of coax cable feed in the antenna or the, the ATU. Um, and I also attached a counterpoise. Now the counterpoise was around about 40 foot of wire, just dangling out of the window, then going along the ground, um, basically underneath the antenna. Um, its position didn't seem to be particularly important and its length didn't seem to be particularly important, but it did make a difference if I removed it. Um, so basically I used a uh, three meter length of coax cable feed in the uh, matching unit, uh, the Anun that is, and around about 40 foot of um, flex on the ground as a counterpoise. And, uh, the antenna, as you I think we've already covered, is was 53 foot. Sorry, it's in feet, but that's the measurement I made. And uh, if you want to convert it to meters, then pick up your your smartphone, and uh, you can do it that way. Now, just just finally, just a couple of uh, comparisons of on-air signals on on 40 meters. Uh, by comparison, this is on my main 40 meter dipole, and this is the. Anun. Right, this again is on my uh, main dipole and that's switching over to the random length of wire. That's the main antenna and uh, that's the Anun. There's not too much difference. So what do I think about the LDG 9 to 1 Anun and the so-called random length of wire? Well, certainly the transformer seems to work well. Uh, it seems to have a very low insertion loss, so I had no problems with it there. And I also experienced some modest VSWR on a lot of the bands. I couldn't, I could get down to about 1.5 to 1 on a band, but that, that then threw the other bands out. And in my experience, it was better to settle for something like a 2, 2.5 to 1 on several bands than have one very low VSWR and then have a series of high VSWRs. But as I already said, the high VSWR is really of no practical consequence in terms of signal strength. So uh, you shouldn't have any worries there. I think that it is ideal for portable. I think it is great if you want to set up a station very quickly and get on the air. And I suppose that if you're a newcomer to ham radio, that transformer, the LDG one, is going to cost you what, $29.95 and a length of wire. Now, a length of wire um, is only going to cost a small amount of money. In fact, I, on occasions I've gone to, down to the local hardware store got some twin flex, pulled it apart and got twice the length of wire um, for an antenna. So um, in, in that respect, it is quite attractive. Now, one other thing I would say is that I have used the shortest practical length of wire. You can use longer lengths of wire. And I think as the wire gets longer, so you get more dips in the VSWR and 
you're more likely to find that you get the better VSWR across the bands than when you use a shorter length of wire because if you get a lot more dips then the chances are those dips um, are going to coincide with the bands, the ham radio bands. Um, I haven't actually tested it uh, on a longer wire but I'm pretty sure that uh, if you were to increase the length of wire um, you're going to get a better match across the bands. So that's my take on the um, 9 to 1 Anun in conjunction with a random length of wire. It's been an interesting experience. I've learned some things which I didn't know before. I, at least I didn't have any practical experience. And um, I certainly uh, uh, wouldn't hesitate in recommending it, particularly if you want to try uh, an experiment with antennas. And the fact that you can run out a length of wire um, and be pretty sure that you can match it with your internal ATU has got to be a plus. So thanks for watching this video and I do appreciate you tuning into this channel. Don't forget to press the subscribe button and uh, also don't forget of course that we've got a lot of kit down at Portsmouth. If you're buying a transceiver or buying an ATU or buying an SWR meter or antenna mast or whatever, check our website and they're all on there. So thanks for watching this video. Take care and speak soon.